welcome to the Free Cities Podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode number 37 of the Free Cities Podcast. Well, today we are back in Lisbon for a brief conversation I had with a gentleman by the name of Andreas Hellman, who I managed to intercept just before he went on stage at LibertyCon. Andreas is the Director of Outreach, Tax and Regulatory Policy at Tholos Foundation, which is the international arm of Americans for Tax Reform. Now, as a passionate advocate for the free market, Andreas speaks quite critically of the workings of big government and, of course, its tax policies. We discuss questions such as where do government policies do most harm, why do governments keep getting bigger, and what would actually be the optimum size for a government. Spoiler alert, it's not zero or nothing, as I'm sure some of you might have hoped. Anyway, Andreas also reveals the implications to free city models of large intergovernmental tax harmonisation, which is a term straight out of the playbook of Orwell's Ministry of Truth, in my opinion. I finish the discussion by posing the question, how much should we pay for governance? All important issues if you are into the idea of keeping your governments competitive. Anyway, don't forget, you can get in touch with me via the Free Cities Foundation social media channels as usual. Thanks for all the suggestions of new people to interview. They're all greatly appreciated and I'm following them all up. And in the meantime, of course, it just leaves for me to say to you, please sit back, relax as always and enjoy my conversation with Andreas Hellman. Maybe you should introduce yourself. How about that? Sure. Um, So Americans for Tax Reform has uh, like a second entity that does all the international work, and that is called the Tholos Foundation. Previously, it was uh, Americans for Tax Reform Foundation. So we just rebranded that part. Um, and so I'm the director of outreach, uh, tax, and regulatory policy at Dolores Foundation. Right. Okay. So maybe you should tell me then what Americans for Tax Reform does in, in the basic level. And then the we'll take it from level. there. Yeah. Okay. The, one, the, the, the elevator pitch, let's say. The, the elevator pitch is that um, we bring uh, people from the center-right movement together. Um, and I feel like the the concept that stands out for us is that not everyone in the in the center right world has to agree with the other person in the same movement. They only have to agree <clears throat> on one thing, and that is that they all have to realize that in order for them to reach their own goals, they have to be left alone by the government. So there is someone in the room who probably let's say the vote moving issue for this person is religious freedom, wants to pray all day, and wants to educate his children, probably at home. The next person in the room is someone deeply cares about gun rights. Second Amendment is his vote-moving issue. And then there's another person in the room, and he probably, he's a homeschooler. He's into homeschooling. He doesn't want the, the government to take their his or her kids and, and put them in government schools. And so they might sit at a dinner table and they really don't like the other issue and the other person. And they say, you know what, like you're crazy for homeschooling your children. Like, you, you know, how can you be sure that they get the best education? And, you know, are you going to set them up to fail in life? And the other person is saying, well, how can you play with guns all day? And guns are dangerous. And I don't like guns and, you know, keep them away from me. And then there's another person who just doesn't care what the other pe- people talk about because he's praying all the time. And they don't have to agree and they don't have to like each other, but... They will be a team because if they stick together, all they want is to be left alone from the government telling them what to do or not to do. And that is basically our principle. We have um, we have what's called the Wednesday meeting. Happens, as the name says, every Wednesday. Brings in 150, 200 people uh, in Washington, D.C. into the same room. Uh, there's, uh, you know, 
senators, congressmen, their staffers, other third party groups, um, people from the business community, they all come together every Wednesday um, and they present on issues that are happening this week, something that comes up maybe in a week or two, and they try to find um, other people that also care about that same issue and try to build a coalition to actually, you know, the advocacy would be stronger. And that is something that we do. And all of these people in the room necessarily not agree on uh, the other uh, person's topic, um, but they are unified in the what we call the Leave Us Alone Coalition. And that's what we do. And we do it um, every Wednesday on federal issues in D.C. And we have um, a, a meeting, a very similar meeting in every state. Um, and then we also have 23 of these International Wednesday meetings um, all over the world in capitals. Wow. But you know what's the connection with tax here (laughs) then like the meetings are specifically about tax issues no it's about all issues that the center-right movement cares about um the reason that we're called americans for tax reform is uh because uh, we were uh founded to support uh and set up uh president reagan's uh, tax reform agenda at the time Ah. and out of that um you know we developed other projects. For example, the Taxpayer Protection Pledge uh, is one of our main projects, and that is a commitment where a candidate for office or a politician can sign uh, the pledge, and he pledges to the voters, to his constituents, that he will not raise uh, or uh, impose new taxes uh, during his time in office. And that's a very, very powerful tool, and it's a great tool for people to know what they vote for, right? If you If you look at the different candidates and you can decide... You know, what do I know about this guy? What about the other guy? Oh, this guy signed the pledge. So at least I know, you know, he will not raise my taxes. He will not um, impose new taxes. And that is a very, very powerful tool. What I liked about what you said then was the Leave Me Alone Coalition. That literally describes me. <laughs> I'm I'm a one-man Leave Me Alone Coalition in my life. Um, as far as the Leave Me Alone Coalition goes... Like what? What's what's your preferred size of government then? When it comes down to it, you know, like my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, whatever your personal. Or... So I, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, but I feel like I can give somewhat of a comprehensive answer because I I was born and raised in Germany, so I had the experience of big government and a government that is there for you uh, at every step of the way, if you uh-huh. want it or not. And now I have uh, the experience living in the um, United States since uh, the end of 2016, uh, where I have somewhat a more ver- limited version of government. And I, I do think um, that we should all agree on like basic government functions. Uh, and I feel like that is uh, policing. Uh, there has to be some form of uh, effective uh, community policing. Um, and I feel like things like, uh, you know, uh, the fire department, uh, and to some extent roads, um, where the free market can't solve problems. I feel like that is where the government is needed. Um, but then there's a lot of areas where government actually does a lot of harm, uh, even though they're, they're calling it solutions to problems, they just create new and bigger problems and it's somewhat of a vicious cycle. Um, and oftentimes if, if you just let people be, uh, you have a much, much better outcome, often it also cheaper outcome for the taxpayers overall. What would you say then, <clears throat> where do you see the most harm in, in your work, uh, you know, uh, in your work at the Americans for Tax Reform? What's the, what are the common harms that you see coming up time and time and again at the meetings? It, it is um, less innovation, um, regulation that severely hurts the economy, uh, hurts jobs hurts, uh, I would say, the West's competitiveness uh, with uh, China, for example. Um, there's a lot of problems that we have on that front that we that could go away w- very, very quickly if we would just stop uh, solving problems, if, if, if the government would stop trying to solve problems that are actually non-existent. That in, at your organization, do you deal with things like that? Or uh, no, I in my everyday work, I I mainly deal with uh, tax policy proposals mm-hmm. um, and the effects of those proposals. Um, we deal a lot with uh, trade policy and then regulatory policy um, that has an effect on on the economy. Yeah, but um, and then coalition building is the is the second big part of my work to find uh, you know partner organizations all around the world uh, to grow the. 
um, the coalition that we have. Yeah. But the, what are the main? What are the big issues that you know that I might you know particularly know of? You know, like what you t- get, tell me I, some success stories. Sure. Say, now, right? I mean, I guess now we're we're get into the boring. Uh, stuff. Well, we don't have oh. to get into the boring stuff. I was cognizant. I wasn't asking you about what you did. I'll but. tell you. Um, <laughs> so, in 2017, uh, the European Union uh, tried to impose what's called a digital services tax, and that is a tax. It was a three percent tax on global revenue, revenue, mm. and. That, I didn't know about that. That sounds really terrible. <laughs> well, I didn't. Even, global like, I, revenue. Let me wait until you no, tell the rest. Yeah. Global. <laughs> wait a minute. What do you mean global revenue? Like everything combined. Oh my god! And it was written and designed uh, in a way that it was so narrow that it would only attack, or I, I shouldn't use attack, but it would only affect four companies. And those four companies were Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. So it was politically motivated, was it? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so they came up with this tax. And surprisingly, it did not find a lot of... Uh, it, find, it did find a lot of support from like high-tax countries like Germany and France and others. But then there were people or there were countries from uh, Ireland to Malta and Hungary and others that you know oftentimes have the lowest corporate tax rate in the European Union. And uh, especially Ireland is, um, you know, is a host to many of these uh, companies and their subsidiaries uh, for them to enter the European market. And they have a very low tax rate. And so the sentiment at the time was, well, they're not paying their fair share. And, uh, you know, it's, if they stay, they don't pay their fair share. I think it would be interesting to see what is the fair share and what are they actually paying. And so we looked at the effect of corporate tax rates. And it turned out that if you look at the if you look at the effective corporate tax rates, those companies often paid more in taxes than their non-digital counterparts. And what the European Union did was they used the sentiment in many European countries of you know American big tech is terrible. Uh, they use your data oftentimes without your permission. They sell your data, and they do whatever they want with it. And you get nothing in return. And on top of that, they're not even paying for our roads and schools and social services. And um, it was intended for uh, to go into effect. And it would have been the first European tax ever, right? The European Union finances itself through the member states. And they don't like that very much, the bureaucrats in Brussels, because they always have to go and ask. But if you start your own revenue stream, you start it with 3%. And, you know, maybe in two years they would have increased it to like four or whatever. They could. Can you just do that as the European Union? Well, you can, but you need consent from all member states. And well, so it, at the end of the no, day, at like... the end of the day, it, the proposal failed. And they tried a couple of times, but it failed um, because not all member states would be on board with this. I didn't realize they had the power to, to work on that level, to tax. I thought that was the sole responsibility of the member the, states. Yeah, of the states. Yeah. But but the, you're saying that the EU as an organization, yeah, the the the, the, the Parliament the and the Commission, right, right, yeah, they, that's that was their goal, and it failed, and they don't. Have, sorry to butt in again, but they don't do that in any other shape or form. No, no, it would it's have been the so, first time, right? But there is this big interest of having another source of funding for sure I'm that is surprised. a little bit uh, less dependent on begging, yeah, and so. Um, and, and it's all basically designed in very small steps, but it's all designed to form this European super state where the, the nation states have, you know, less responsibilities every single year and, the, and is more directed towards Europe. And I, in my personal um, opinion, I don't think that if you have European solutions that then have to trickle down on the member states. I don't think this is a better solution for people. I think local government is the best way to deal with problems. Local government is too small, can't deal with it, goes one step higher. But we should start it at the bottom to try to solve a problem if there is one. What we shouldn't do is like just direct everything to like oftentimes, you know, undemocratic. Uh, uh, in off- There's people that were not elected into office at the European um um, commission or various departments that they have, and so and then they make decisions that are actually uh, have a huge Im- uh, effect on people's lives. And I feel like that is the wrong way to go. You should start from the other way around. 
So it failed, but then there were countries like France who were still very excited about the revenue. And so they, they said, uh, well, this problem of the, of the era of digital taxation is not going away. Uh, we will start our own uh, unilateral measure. Um, and they took the same design and tweaked it a little bit. Um, it was funny. There were two in the, in the original French proposal. Uh, there were two French companies also affected by this. And uh, they, I guess, had very, very good. Um, they lobbied very, very hard and they got out. And so it, at the end, it was only the, the four American tech companies that were targeted. Um, and there's two things about this tax that are interesting and that have consequences basically for the international tax system. So it's a very long standing principle that we tax based on, you know, where the company is headquartered. So if you look at, uh, let's say a big German company, Volkswagen, it's headquartered in Germany, it's taxed there. You know, it's very, very, it's a very, very good incentive for the German government because they get the majority of, um, tax revenue from that company. And if you take this uh, principle of the physical presence away and you say, we only look at, you know, where the users of that product or service are. And that's what, that's what the tax tried to do. They, they, they said, the company is based in the United States, but the users, they're based here in Europe. And so we'll, we'll, do, we'll tax the users, right? Like we'll, we'll look at the value proposition and we say like the value is being created by the people that use the service or the product it's like a vat then isn't it it's like a value added tax yeah, yeah basically yeah so if you know like the government will but except ch- except that, uh, we'll, we'll tax volkswagens at source when we buy them if you see what i mean right but except that the, the consumers wouldn't pay directly they wouldn't pay the tax directly the company a, would pay the tax uh, but uh, then the but then the business would obviously raise prices yeah so that at the end of the day, the consumer would did pay the tax. And Does they, that happen they, in any other industries, or is it always headquarters are here? This yeah, is, yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. and um, so it's very, very interesting uh, how they try to get rid of the the principle of value creation. And I often give this example that I feel like illustrates it quite well. Um, under the new rules, you. The value, if you go to like a, you talk to a French winemaker and they have hundreds of years experience of making the best wine, the the value is being created when you drink it on the couch at your home. That's when the value is being created. And you shift that away from the winemaker Hmm. who, uh, you know, poured all of his sweat and knowledge into making the best wine. Um, And that's the same what happens here. Uh, These products and services were uh, invented uh, and um, manufactured basically in the United States. And now we're trying to, what the European Union tried to do and some of the member states is to grab uh, that money and fill their holes that they have with that cash. Um, but the obviously the, sorry about, and the, the digital nature of these things does add a bit of a gray area, doesn't it? I mean, arguably, <clears throat> Google is producing search results <laughs> on a computer in Germany uh, you know is there is there any gray area there you know it's a it's a new it's a new thing isn't it right it, be, it's not like a product that you're creating shipping abroad and, and you know it's arguably created at they have servers in Germany I take it do they I don't I yeah. don't know how it works but yeah well I mean of course at the end of the day this is a new uh area but so was the the car the car is not used uh, in Germany. The car is used in China. The car is used in the U.S. So I'm saying, like, if you if you change these long-standing rules, at the end of the day, it could uh, really harm uh, Europe. It could harm the U.S. even more um, because if you if you change everything to like a user-based tax, then you know at some point China could have the idea and say, look, uh, we have a very nice BMW that are driving around here, but the value is not being created in Bavaria where it's manufactured. The value is being created by a person that drives it here on our streets. And that's where the tax is. And all of a sudden you would lose tremendous amounts of revenue. And what I, you know, what I don't like is that they're trying to cherry pick. So you have to decide it's, it's one way or the other, but you can't just be, well, we pick and choose, uh, however more revenue we can get, uh, that just doesn't work that way. That's kind of how the state function, the big, <laughs> big state 
type of entities like that function. It's like right. they have the power to to think things up and generate money in that way. Most of us have to add value. They get to think of ways to take value. It's like <laughs> right. So so that is one big issue. Um, it then spread out like wildfire because there were lots of governments that said, "Wow, look, uh, this is like we can tax people that can't vote us out of office. Uh-huh. This is fantastic." And there seemed to be like no repercussions, you know, and France imposed their tax at first. So, so wait a minute, it's happened, it's gone, yeah, some of the yeah, member states have yeah. gone through and done it. Yeah, for example, Google paid, uh, last year they paid over $1 billion in, in digital services taxes. In France? In diff- various different countries, it's all combined from all the countries that have these taxes now. And it now. goes into the EU, no, no, so these are the member, member states. states, these member are the states. member states, yeah. blimey. And on top of that comes compliance costs, right? Like if you have all these different new taxes that you have to comply with in different uh, countries, compliance costs goes up as well. And on to- and at the end of the day, you know, businesses don't pay taxes. It's the, it's the customers that pay. The, you know, ads are more expensive. Um, Amazon services fees went up. It's uh, it's the consumers that pay. And so it's fascinating, and that's why I try to explain that um, to people, especially in those countries. There's a lot of people, especially a lot of young people in Europe, that they want to keep their free Gmail account. They would never pay five euro for it. Um, and they want to use um, Amazon the way you use Amazon. Um, and they still support uh, all these measures because they somehow just really don't like American tech companies. And at the end of the day, when they realize, well, I'm, I'm paying that tax, you know, uh, then it opens their eyes in a way and they look differently at this, uh, at this issue. But this is only one problem uh, that we're currently having. Uh, there is a second problem, and that was the government solution to this problem. So, Wait a minute. Which problem are we talking about? The problem so of- <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about the problem of digital taxation, right? right? Okay. Huge compliance costs, um, very unfair. Um, it, it fueled a trade dispute between the United States and Europe. Uh, no one's really happy about it except the people who get the revenue. But it can't stay like that, right? Like there has to be some form of a solution. Otherwise, you, you have this as a problem always. So the, so the um, idea was, you know what? Let the OECD come up with a really good plan how we can fairly address this new form of taxation because indeed we do have you know companies that don't need headquarters really anymore they can operate anywhere they don't need brick and mortar um, and so let's find a fair way how to handle this and so the OECD came up with a uh, pillar one and pillar two plan the pillar one plan is a reallocation of taxation rights so it basically looks at you know, how much revenue does this company A make in, you know, every single country? Um, and let's reallocate some of the taxation rights that would usually be, let's say, in the United States, and we reallocate that to the other countries a little bit. So we would even that out a little bit and everyone's happy. And so they can get rid of their unilateral measures that they that they implemented. So you would reduce compliance costs and you would give them some taxation rights. From the point of view from the United States, it's a terrible deal because your, your tax base is getting lower, right? But you do it basically to acknowledge that there's some form of like new industries and you don't want to trade war and you need to have some kind of agreement. And then the pillar two in this proposal, and I find this very fascinating um, because it had nothing to do with the original problem. Uh, but they were able to sneak in because it was uh, the, the dream of the European Union was to eliminate tax competition. And for a very long time, they tried to um, pass proposals where um, Ireland and Hungary and others you know, wouldn't be allowed to have um, their low tax rates and make decisions for themselves. And they, they, what they call it, they call it tax harmonization. <laughs> Sounds Very great. Sounds, it, yeah. it sounds really good. Uh, it sounds much better than tax competition. Yeah. And so they came up with all these really fancy uh, phrases. You know, we have to end the race to the bottom, right? It's the race to the bottom sounds great. <laughs> to me, it sounds great. To a lot of people, it's just like, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, no, no race to the bottom. You know, we all need to fund our governments and pay for the schools. Anyway, so they um, came up uh, during these negotiations and said, well, we need a global minimum tax. And they don't need the global minimum tax for the whole globe, but like it would solve a huge problem. If they don't have uh, enough votes in the European Union to pass a, I don't know, European minimum tax, because there's 
Hungary, Ireland, others that say, no, we don't want this. But if they um, make them agree to it through like a global deal from a non-democratic Paris-based organization like the OECD, then they can say, well, look, in order for us to like be part of that deal and also get the taxation rights, the money that we really want that we would reallocate then to you, you know, we also have to have the pillar two, which is the global minimum tax. And so there was a lot of fighting about this. Uh, I thought it was like a very, very smart move for the European leaders from the union uh, to like sneak in the, the ta tax harmonization uh, issue and, and kind of like solve their, their problem there of the race to the bottom from like Hungary and Malta and others and Luxembourg. And um, I was very surprised because when the Biden administration took over, it's kind of like when the when the negotiations were kind of dead, uh, Trump didn't like either pillar one or pillar two. He thought it was like not good for the U.S., so like he wanted to stay out of it. He'd rather fight uh, these these trade wars and and unilateral you know, measures that we're seeing from France and others. And President Biden came on the stage, and you know I feel like after four years of very complicated relationships with uh, between the U.S. and Europe, uh, he just wanted to be like the nice guy who makes everyone happy, and he needed the he wanted to be in the middle of the photo, everyone smiles at him, and right? So he said, yeah, I have no problem with the global minimum tax. Still 15%. So that's how we ended up with, uh, with the global minimum tax. And um, Is that, I don't even know there was such a thing as a global minimum tax. I'm not being funny. Is that real? Yeah, it's a real proposal. Oh, it's a proposal. I well, was no, say. It's, we're in the stage of implementation. But what about places like Dubai and uh, are there countries well, not that aren't... everyone signed up right, just because okay, it's right, signed? Right, uh, right, yeah, okay. yeah. Who signed up then? Did the UK sign up? Yeah, there's 142 countries now that signed up on this deal. Um, God. But and that is the interesting part. Uh, some countries uh, like the UK and China and others they negotiated uh, exemptions. <laughs> <laughs> for rich people, what? Tell me something I don't know. Go on. <laughs> for uh, certain industries. Right. So like financial services, banks, things like that in the oh, UK. Oh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, and then what they call emerging oh, industries in China. And if you look at uh, what they claim to be like emerging industries, it's uh, it's industries that are heavily competitive, competing with ours. And and it's, it's just giving them another uh, advantage. Because if you look at what this what this tax does in a way is it artif it creates like an OPEC for taxes, right? And it also artificially reduces uh, the West's ability to compete with China and India and others, uh, because we will never be able to go lower than fifteen. Who knows what happens in five years? Maybe it's twenty then. Like there's only one way to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, but China, for example, has the you know they can just subsidize if they want to. Mm. And uh, and they can compete in ways that we then cannot compete anymore. There, if there's no incentive for governments to be more efficient, to lower taxes, to be more competitive, because there's this OPEC where we all like, you know, it's really interesting how how they just like make up their minds along the way. You have in Europe, you have all these people who want to, you know, break up big companies. Because they're saying big is bad and we need more competition and antitrust enforcement is so important because we need competition. But then the same people say when it comes to governments, big is great, no competition, end the race to the bottom, global minimum tax. And again, like you can't have it both ways. What would be good for the free market is also good for government competition. And of course, there's high tax uh, countries like Germany and France. They're very excited about this because they were less competitive before. They're very high taxes. And so they can vote yes on this, no problem, because they say, well, you know, within this, like a snap of my finger, I'm getting, I'm being more competitive. A quick question though when the vote happens, the EU doesn't have a single vote, does it? The member states vote. The member states implement. But say one state in the EU yeah. didn't want to do this. Does that mean none of them can? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And we have we had that problem two times. I mean, what problem? We we were excited um, that there were two countries that didn't like it. Unfortunately, um, who's that? Uh, so first it was Poland. Uh, they had objections, um, and they got a bigger a bigger piece of the COVID relief fund. 
from the European Union, and that made their that made them say yes. Made their complaints go away. <laughs> uh, and then Hungary noticed. Well, you know, if Poland can do it, maybe oh, yeah, we can do yeah, it. Yeah. And so they, all of a sudden they objected and they said, um, "We're not part of this. We're for tax sovereignty. We're for tax competition." And uh, I thought from the beginning that they uh, that they did mean it. They wouldn't act on principle. They just wanted what Poland got, or they felt they were treated unfairly, or they felt like there's more for us to gain. Uh, and I was unfortunately. Uh, I was I was right at the end of the day. They said uh, our objections that we had have been addressed, and we look forward to joining this deal. So this is a relatively, you know, serious implications for, um, you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> obviously, do you know much about free cities? By the way, our model. I mean, our model is basically competing governance models. It's basically, okay. yeah, right. And obviously, uh, you know, we, we advocate for jurisdictions that basically, um, you know, help individual sovereignty and individual liberty. But the important aspect really of them is that they're kind of opportunities to have different governance models and compete. And t- tax is one of those models right <laughs> basically Very it's one of the model. powerful yeah. ones yeah. yeah so you know the the harmonization of tax is obviously a terrible idea for governance because you don't like it, harmony yeah exactly i mean I, I i think their pr company have done a really good job but it's so orwellian and i hate all that stuff the way they do this you know friendly fire you know whatever whatever it is but um but yeah, that has huge implications because um, taxation is one of the, I think, one of the main reasons people vote with their feet and move around the world and go here to here and, you know, yeah. and it's essentially uh, another on, uh, you know, onslaught on movement. In- it is like a, any uh, decision that you personally make with your money, in my opinion. So for, uh, just to give you an example, um, I can live with a higher tax rate in Germany, way better than if I would pay that exact same high tax rate in the US. And the reason is the value proposition. In Germany, uh, I, I would still be in favor of like making my own decisions and just keeping more of my money and then spending it the way I want it. But if there, you know, but if I have to, in Germany, I get a uh, fantastic healthcare system. I can send uh, my kids to uh, free daycare, quality daycare, uh, I can send them to excellent public schools, excellent public universities. And on top of that, you know, if, if ever anything would happen to me, I would get unemployed or whatever. I would never lose my health benefits and I would still then get like some form of like a, a social stipend from the government. So like the, the value proposition there is much, much better compared to you save probably like 20% in taxes in the US if I compare, you know, the, the two countries. But in the U.S., I don't get anything. I, I really don't. I mean, I probably, I probably get the police in the fire department if they sh- decided to show up, which is, which you can't anyway. be sure. <laughs> like that, the amount of times where I was on hold with nine one one, please hold. Yeah. I hope it's nothing serious. <laughs> or the amount of times I called them and they just didn't come because mm-hmm. there were other more important calls. But wait a minute. If it's a, you say fifteen percent minimum tax, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean everyone pays fifteen. No, it's it? uh, corporate. Yeah, right. But it's not set at 15. It can be... It's the minimum. The minimum, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, currently, what's the what's the corporate tax rate in America currently then? Uh, what's currently the tax rate? I think currently it's uh, 20. I have to look it up, but I think it's 26. Right, okay. Or 28. But so it will stay the same though. Right, but the point is that other countries that were more competitive before, they are up. Yes. So the countries that had higher taxes before and were less competitive are now more competitive than the other countries that wanted to compete. Right. And that's unfair. Right. Right? You let me put it this way. So you have a country like Germany, great infrastructure, high taxes. Yeah. You had a country like Hungary, good infrastructure, good education system, good place for people to be employed. You have 
lots of people there that would that work in like high paying jobs. Um, but you have a lower tax rate because there is less incentive than to be in in yes. Germany, right? Yeah. So it's a business decision you have to make. You have to say, do I need uh, all what Germany offers me, and I'm I then have to pay the higher tax rate, or can I accomplish my business in in Hungary hmm. and pay less in tax? And so all of a sudden, the decision for businesses to like stay in Germany or to like go to Germany or France for that matter is a little easier. So it favors the high, I get it now, it favors the high tax right? bracket p- places. Yeah. They become more, more competitive, competitive. Right. Without right, yeah, actually yeah, yeah. being more competitive. Right. So why are the other ones signing this then? Why, why are they kind of low tax? Oh, that's a lot of pressure. There's yeah. a lot of pressure. And so you have kind of like this, this carrot stick right in front of you and that's pillar one. Yeah. That's reallocation of taxation rights. You only get that if you, it's a two pillar approach if you vote for the whole thing. It, I mean, where does this end, just out of interest? Because like you say, this is now, that makes a kind of monopoly on tax. OPEC, like, yeah. Right, right, yeah. So, and, and like you say, it doesn't, it doesn't go down. I doubt they're going to vote to make it go down at any... I other. mean, it's not impossible, but can you remember one tax that, was, that, 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 that did not go up or that was abolished? momentarily yes i you know we had stamp duty momentarily <laughs> frozen during covid okay for like what, six months but yeah i know what you mean yeah but frozen just means it stayed the same it just no did. no no it was it was off the table it was yeah, off the table yeah yeah yeah. people sold houses with no tax for a six month period it was a stimulation tool the trying to stimulate the economy is so okay it's backward to even think that someone would come up with that idea like okay let's help the poor by sort of like <laughs> saying there's no stamp duty on houses for six months but anyway um yeah i don't think it's a good development i think it will go up from there mm. and the biggest problem i see is that once you're in this um multinational undemocratic paris-based oecd approach i feel like you give a lot of uh sovereignty away right like what what yeah. comes next what if the majority of those member states decide we want 20 percent, and you're like you know what i was really uncomfortable with 15 but i did it for whatever i don't want this yeah you know i feel like uh it's gonna get really difficult yeah and uh what happens at the end of the day when you artificially uh you know eliminate competition even more with an even higher rate um and you build more pressure uh, to, to stay in the game. Um, I think it will just overall, and that is my concern in the long run, because that's what I think about is how can we make sure that the West stays ahead uh, in terms of innovation uh, and also, you know, jobs, good high paying jobs in their economies in, in competing with China. And I feel like we're doing everything we can to basically, if it's a race, Right, we're giving uh, everything that we have uh, to China to make them go faster, and we're taking all the weights from them and saying, like, please give us more weights and ankle weights and arm weights and whatnot, so we can we can even run slower, and um, and it bothers me and it concerns me because I feel like, uh, you know, w- we need to be lighter now, we need to be faster, we need to be more uh, innovative, more. Do you know why this is happening? Is it? It's not because I mean it's easy to think of it as almost conspiratorial. Like it, it can't just be Joe Biden wanting to be friendly and be nice to it. Right? There's a lot of things uh, that I don't know why they're happening and they concern me. Like if you look at the the things that we now have to say, where we know they're not true, but you face uh, tremendous problems if you say that they're not true. If you look at the whole like gender ideology, like, mm. you, you, you know, you have to, if you don't say that this is a woman now and you can clearly see it's a man, you you have a problem. It's the it's like the emperor's new clothes. That's what, you know that, yeah. The, yeah. So, it's very much like that. But Every you, but you don't, the, the problem is like you, if you don't have uh, the, the space for an honest discussion, and I don't mean for an agreement it doesn't have to be an agreement all the time but sure. i mean a discussion if you if you if you don't allow people to talk anymore then you, the solutions you will get are just terrible 
because there's not there's no competition for the best idea. If if you just like, you know, draw all these fences up in the conversation and you say like you can't talk about this, you can't talk about this, you can't say this or that, and we basically have to agree. I mean, in the case of what we were talking about here, uh, it, the government's not incentivized to necessarily um, discuss this hugely. Um, you know, the, the centralizing force, which mm-hmm. is what it's what's at work here, um, is 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 pretty powerful. And the, the, you know, the the more it moves in that direction, the more powerful it becomes as well. And it it I mean from what you said anyway it's, di- it's working directly against the individual. This is this is the the centralized end game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is the end game yeah. of the the centralized entity, isn't it? Like, yeah. So I, I mean <laughs> I don't want to get too dark and dreary about it, but before we go on, you do realize it's like oh. What time is it? Three forty-five. Okay, let's do like five more minutes. And okay, we'll round this up. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I That's would love okay. to talk more because this yeah. is this is interesting, and I, you know, I don't. This is a world I don't know a huge amount about. I know uh, apart from you know, I pay tax and I don't like it. Just out of interest, what's your own personal opinion on tax? Well, I do realize that there is a for like a civilized society, there is a cost of having certain things and living together peacefully. Uh, and I'm happy to, you know, contribute, but only to the extent uh, that is really necessary and allows everyone to have the maximum of freedom in their lives to make decisions with the money that they earn. Um, that That's my personal view. I mean... Do you know how that, how does that manifest in a governance model, for example? Like, is it, um, you know... Everyone pays as much as they can. Is it voluntarism? Is it 5%? Is it? Anyway? I'm not again. If, if there's someone, and I, I always say that to my liberal friends who complain that they're, either, they're not getting taxed enough. There's this wonderful line on the IRS form. You can like donate as much money as you want to the IRS. People don't do it. And then the ar- second argument comes always and they say, well, you know, um, of course I'm not doing this voluntarily, you know, because I want everyone to do it. So like, of course, like we need, you know, better tax policy to like make sure that the rich are paying. And I'm like, I don't believe you. Like, if we would actually do this and you would have to, like, pay, like, a wealth tax of whatever percent, you would probably be really upset and you would overthink your decision. It's just, like, whenever it doesn't materialize, it sounds good. You you, you feel better as a person, right? Um, but I don't think they really mean it. Otherwise, they would just do it right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there is a cost of government. And it doesn't really ma- matter, like, how much you make, uh from your salary or from your business. Uh, but the cost should be the same kind of like for everyone else, right? Like if you, if there's a certain cost and it's bra- you can break it down per person uh, in your city, in your country, uh, everyone should pay the same. And I realize there's some people who can't pay it. So then you need to, you need to have some people who make a little bit more to like subsidize that in a way to like a certain extent. But um, I don't see uh, why people should be punished uh, for like making more money or having a successful business. It doesn't make any sense. Tax policy was designed to, you know, stop certain behavior, right? Uh, the government claims they want us to stop smoking. So they make the cigarette price very, very high. They don't want us to burn fossil fuels. So they don't want us to drive around in their, in our cars anymore. So like the, the, the fuel tax is very high. Same with like airplane surcharges and all these things. It's all like a, a policy that they claim will stop people from, you know, using fossil fuels or like from using cars and things like that because of the climate. And the question is like, oh, so you just don't want me to work anymore? Like, is that it? Because like you tax my labor, like you tax what I I do. Uh, so you just, I guess, have no interest in me working more, being more successful because you, like at the end of the day, like it would just, uh, you take more. And it just doesn't make any sense um, for the government to take so much money away from people. Well, I mean, it makes sense for them. Well, who is who is them, though, right? Like, Well, I, I know. And I mean, uh, you know, I, I haven't thought extremely deeply about this, but certainly when COVID happened and suddenly there was free money everywhere, it did sort of sort of make a number of people aware that actually taxation isn't something that you necessarily need to do it's a it's a it's almost like a social social engineering tool more than anything because we saw governments suddenly out of nowhere uh you know 
create a, a bunch of money and give it away. They didn't get that money through tax, that's for sure. Well, think, think about it again when I said in the beginning that often the solution from the government to the problem is much more problematic than the original uh, uh, problem that we faced. During COVID, uh, you know, the government would give out like lots of free money with checks and, 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 and loans that were forgiven later and whatnot. Um, and then we have inflation that affected, that really affects uh, the people who really have no money. Like the, for them, a 15% increase on things they need to buy just to survive is, is absolutely terrifying. And so what's the, what's the solution then from the government there? You know, um, it, I feel like if they would have not done anything, right, uh, we wouldn't see these numbers of inflation. It's a and so I'm saying like there's always more problems if the government gets involved. Hmm. And, and that is something that I feel like more people should realize that they call for help, right? Like there, there's this uh, wonderful quote from uh, Reagan about um, the government. He says like, what are the nine most terrifying words in the English language? I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I feel like in so many ways, this, uh, this actually like people can relate to that now um, where the one thing I want to mention uh, where I'm really upset about because I feel like it is just something where um, we have like another form of obsession now uh, with government officials, and that is addressing climate change. Like governments generally are unable to solve basic problems. They only make it worse. But somehow we all feel like we should trust our governments to solve climate change where we don't really know, you know, will it go in this or that direction? Um, but we all, we all agree that we will severely limit our lives and the things that we can do and afford in our lives because there might be a problem there that then we trust the government to solve. I feel like this is absolutely mind-blowing crazy. Hmm. And then we're, we're destroying the most successful industries that we have in Europe uh, on top of that. We're, we're ending the combustion engine in Europe. That is the, the most important industry in, in Germany that is responsible for most of the wealth of that country. Just like that. Realizing that we can't solve climate change alone, even if in Europe we would have no carbon emissions. You know, we can't just go to India and like other emerging nations and be like, you know what? We had it really good for long decades, and we polluted quite a bit, and we, our, our economies were fueled by all of this. And so our standard of living is very, very high. And we do understand you also would like to have a very, very similar standard of living, but we decided now is the last moment to save the planet, so you cannot do that. Then we'll just be like, no, thank you. Exactly. We're, we're doing what we want to do. So like we're destroying our own economies, our own you know, standard of living in a way, uh, for then other countries, like we, they, we can't stop them, right? Like, what do you want to do? They, they will probably emit more and more and more and more, and they will build coal power plants. There is, look at the number of coal power plants that we're, that we're building. And, um, and that concerns me that what happens at the end of the day? Is this just like a giant wealth transfer? Like, who's going to be the new superpower if, if the West is just uh, destroying itself for climate reasons? Well, you know, I mean, China, you mentioned it, China and India mainly, maybe South America somewhere. So how is that going to go for uh, human rights yeah, issues, yeah. Uh, freedom in general? I'm fully on board with the government fuck everything up uh, narrative. It's a <laughs> very nice ending of this uh, <laughs> short podcast. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a shame, really. I know that you've got to go and I know we've, we've had a short talk uh, as it goes, but... Um, can I just ask you one quick question? Sure. This is it's a traditional question we ask everyone okay. on the pod. Um, if you had a year sabbatical paid for, hmm. money at your disposal, you have a patron, hmm. what would you do in that year? What would I do? And it would be right now? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you could carry on working if you want. You, you, you know, you, you just, you're not, you're not um, inhibited by money. That's the essence of it. And I, I have to do it now. I can't do it in like three years. Yeah, go on then. Let's, let's say you've got to do it now. I just made that up. <laughs> so I could go in three years? No, you no, got to do it now. I have to go now? Okay. <laughs> well, I was. let me just say this. I was about to say if I could do it in like two or three years. Uh, my daughter is 14 months now. Um, so I would have, I probably would wait 
to take the sabbatical. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll until let you, I've she's, got girls as well. You un, can do that. Okay. I grant that. Yeah. Until she's a little bit older, and I would just like take that year, and I would like her to see as many places in the world as possible, because uh, and this is getting dark now. Because I feel like the earlier she can see certain places and form memories, create memories, and see societies how they were, uh, the better it is, because it will not get better. If I look back at my childhood and how I was raised in a very prosperous, safe environment where I could like run around, nothing would happen to me, and I look at like how our societies are shaping now, um, it's scary. And so I feel like it would be really nice to just take that time and show her all kinds of places in the world, um, basically before everything goes to shit. And we have to keep working that it, it won't happen because we have a responsibility to our children that we want them to be able to ra be raised in, in a very similar way than, than we were. And um, and unfortunately, I, I, I'm not that optimistic, but I guess it's very, very nice that people like you and others today here at uh, LibertyCon are working for more freedom and uh, for a more prosperous future. Well, thanks, Andrew. I, I, that's a great. I like that. It's a great sentiment. I, I kind of agree with you. I, I suppose secretly, I'm, a, I'm trying to be a more optimistic, but I agree. You know, make hay while the sun shines, if you can, as well as also being part of this movement for freedom, which I, I, I see as there's no other reason to live really currently at the moment. It's the only thing you can do. Yeah. But um, thanks for a brief conversation and uh, maybe we do a, a longer one again when you've got more time. But Absolutely. thanks for coming, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah.